to figure out what our interpreting ministry looks like going forward. So if you don't mind, we would love your help. We want to know if you use this service and how you use it. Do you watch online? Do you come in person? Do you watch it later in the week? Which one do you do? And if you don't mind, if you could please just let us know by filling out the, the survey with the QR code that's provided at the side of the screen. Once that pops up, go ahead and fill that out and that'll give us the answers we need for us to figure out what this ministry looks like going forward. Again, thank you so much. We appreciate you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, my name is Josh Trubel. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Fellowship. It's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Um, we're going to go right into Habakkuk, and we're going to do the baptisms at the end. Um, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk. Um, there are a lot of different ways to say it. Some of you guys saw the video online. Um, uh, there's a missionary friend of mine from... Uh, um, uh, she's, she's currently in Brazil. They, they speak uh, Portuguese there. And she said, we call it abacuki. <laughs> abacuki. Um, anyway, um, now that's important. Habakkuk. Um, so we're going to go through the whole book. The whole book, it's three chapters in Habakkuk. And I want to walk you guys through just a couple concepts that make you understand better what it means that we're going through Habakkuk together. So here's a quick slide of the times that we have done different Bible series at Grace Fellowship Church. Now, we do two primary kinds of series here. So sometimes we will do what's called a topical series where we'll take a topic like relationships or, or end times or their, their prayer, and we'll try to give you what the whole Bible has to say on that particular topic. And we're kind of hopping around everywhere uh, in order to present that answer to you. But sometimes we've just done a book of the Bible, a section of scripture, and we take it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Now, why is that important? Because... It gives you a chance to form a stronger relationship with your Bible. If I could underline the word your there, your Bible, because you are meant to have a relationship with God yourself that is outside of this church. And the Bible is your Bible. And as you open it up for yourself, the Lord gets to speak to you directly, not with the aid of the pastor every single time, right? It says in, in, in Peter, he says that we are kings and priests, did you know you're a priest today if you were in Christ? And, and that messes with some of you because the tradition you came from, it was only clergy who could deliver the Bible to you. But that is not what God's word says in the New Testament. You are meant to pick it up for yourself. And so we have done like Genesis. We did the life of Joseph. We did that whole section. We did Exodus. We looked at the plagues and we did the foreign gods that were in Egypt and how God destroyed them and stood against them. We did the entire book of Ruth one time. Book of Jonah, we did the entire thing. We're going to do the whole book of Habakkuk. We've done James. We've done the entire book of Hebrews. Philippians, you just see a list there. These are the times in recent years that we've been able to walk you through a series like this. And so Habakkuk, that's what we're about to do. Um, now, the next slide's really going to freak you out if you're not already a Bible chart. Amen? Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. Um, so <laughs> there's this wonderful church. Um, Engadine and Heathcote Anglican Church. I had to look them up and ask them if I could use their Bible chart because it was so simple and so colorful, let's be honest. And I just, I really, really liked it and I wanted to show it to you today. Here's why. The Bible is 66 books, Old and New Testament. And sometimes, have you ever had the moment where you just kind of open the Bible up at random and you like look at a page and you have no idea where you are in the big story? And sometimes what you're reading doesn't make a lot of sense to you because you don't know where you are in the big narrative. And so I just wanted to show you this just really briefly because it just kind of, it just kind of simplifies it in a way that I think we can understand just a little bit. So I'm going to try and walk you through this just a, a little bit and, and you will be tested on this later. Just kidding. You will not be tested on this later. So in the Old Testament, it starts with Adam and Eve in the garden and God creates the world. Yes, God creates the world. And then you've got the patriarchs and the, the one that's most important to us here today is Abraham because Abraham is that first person who really hears from God and walks with God and God makes a covenant with Abraham. What that is, is that's a one-sided promise that he makes with Abraham. And he says, Abraham, as you follow me in faith, I am going to bless you, Abraham. And a nation is going to come from you, Abraham. And the whole world, every single other nation will be blessed through your nation, Abraham, and your nation is going to be so numerous, people won't even be able to count them. It'll be like the sand on the seashore 
or the stars in the sky, which you can actually see stars in Oklahoma. It's one of the things I like about Oklahoma. So God says that to Abraham and then begins, because of that covenant, the Jewish nation. And then all throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament, we watch it play out, the Jewish nation. And they, 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 they go into Egypt and they go into slavery. And then Moses, Charlton Heston, right? He like goes and frees them out and parts the waters. And they get out of Egypt. And then he goes up on the mountain and he gets the Ten Commandments, right? The stone tablets. And he gives them the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, are, am I going out? Can you hear me? It's all right? Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I need my voice to be louder, Ricky. Um, just kidding. Okay, so he's got the Ten Commandments. And what are the Ten Commandments in the law or the Torah? You know what that is? That is God telling us, this is what my will for your life is. And whenever God tells us what his will for our life is, it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a two-pronged thing. First off, it's a huge blessing because God's wisdom brings God's blessing when we do it, but then it bites us in the end. Because as soon as God tells us what to do, what we find ourselves doing is not doing his will. Can I get a better amen? Second amen. service, right? Like that's our story. And it's the story of God's people. So he plays the whole thing out across the whole Old Testament as God saying, this is what I want you to do. And then we watch them fail over and over and over again. And it gets so bad and the evil gets so bad with God's people, the nation of Israel, that they eventually have a civil war. Do you see it right there? After David and Solomon, these wonderful kings, you have bad kings that come. And they break. We know something in, here in America about civil war. And it becomes the southern kingdom and it becomes the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom is called Israel. And the southern kingdom is called Judah. And some of you guys have already seen that in your Bible reading. They'll refer to God's people as Judah. And you're like, how did this happen? It's because of the civil war. They take, took on two different names. And Judah had Jerusalem. And somehow, if you can imagine, Israel seemed to be a little bit more evil than Judah was. And so God brought judgment. And Assyria came and defeated Israel and carted them off into exile. And so Israel, the northern kingdom, came to an end. Judah lasted just a little bit longer. Babylon was going to eventually come and take over Jerusalem. Actually, they were going to sack the temple itself. Some of you guys remember Daniel in the lion's den? He's in Babylon. That's why that whole thing happens. Why in the world is the prophet Daniel in Babylon? Because they were sent into exile. Eventually, we get the point of the Old Testament story that humanity is not able to keep God's word, not in our own steam. And so eventually the cross comes, Jesus Christ. And why is Jesus Christ good news? Because we need God's word. We need the blessing of knowing what his wisdom is and how to have his blessing in our life. That's all good. But as soon as we fail, we need the forgiveness of Jesus. Because he came and he lived our life as we have lived it. He was tempted in every way that we have been tempted, and yet he did not sin. Then he died on the cross for you so that you could be forgiven every single time you fail. Isn't that good news? So that's essentially the story of the Bible there just in a couple of minutes. Where in the world is Habakkuk in this whole story? Well, he's right here. <laughs> So, so the southern Judah kingdom, right before they go into exile and everything's getting darker and darker and darker in their life, in their culture, and Habakkuk comes in as this prophet and he's got some things to say right before they go into exile. So is everybody caught up the history lesson? You're ready for your exam later. That's so good. Okay, so Habakkuk, just a couple more things about him. Habakkuk was a prophet. Habakkuk, we think, was a professional temple prophet. Now, why is that important? Well, you get to chapter three, which we'll do in another few weeks. And it actually says, he, he actually writes a section of this thing to God, this chapter. And it's a song, like a worship song that he writes. And he gets to the end of the worship song. And he says, this is meant to be played on the string instruments. And the original Hebrew says, my stringed instruments. So scholars believe that he was part of the temple worship. And he's basically saying, play this on my favorite guitar, please. So that's him, probably 607 BC is when he did his prophecy. And at this point, it had been 500 years of evil and rebellion against God. Israel was in a dark time. Again, it was not the days of David. 
They had stopped worshiping Yahweh primarily, and they had brought foreign gods in. And it's not just Sunday school like you, you weren't doing the right thing, right? It's like, no, 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 it's so much more than that. Because when you brought those foreign gods in and you set up their high places and you set up their idols and people were worshiping them instead, the practices of those foreign gods is what polluted God's people because some of them required pr- temple prostitutes. Some of them required slavery. Some of them required that you be unfaithful to your spouse in order to worship that God and get a good harvest of crops this next year. Some of them required human sacrifice, child sacrifice. Now, I'm not embellishing. A lot of those things came in with the worship of these foreign gods. And so God periodically would bring a good king along like Hezekiah, and there would be a revival And they would do away with all those foreign gods and people would start to worship Yahweh again and everything would get better. This is all in the scripture. And then you get bad kings again. And then another good one would pop up named uh, Josiah. Josiah did another revival and they started doing Passover feasts again. Things got better again, but then things got bad. And we believe Habakkuk is writing after Josiah at a time when things have gotten to their absolute worst. We also think that Habakkuk probably experienced as a kid one of those revivals. So he's a guy, spiritually speaking, he knows what revival looks like. Some of you here, you've seen revivals happen in the church, but they're part of your past. And so when you pray for revival, what you mean is I want revival to happen again like I experienced it before. And that's Habakkuk. And so one final thing in your history lesson, right before we read the scripture here, is most prophets that you'll read in the Old Testament, they write to God's people, declaring their sin and that they should repent. They kind of yell at God's people, try to wake them up. Habakkuk's going to be different. He's not going to yell at the people. He's going to yell at God. So Habakkuk is going to be a picture of a prayer life because some of you have yelled at God before. Okay, Habakkuk 1.1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Now that Hebrew word there for oracle is burden. Literally, it means burden. The burden that he saw. Verse two. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Well, he's coming right out the gate, isn't he? He's got some emotions for the Lord. Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save us, God. Why do you make me to watch or see iniquity? And why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. How long, God? How long? He's like, why do you make me look at iniquity? Why do you make me look at all the darkness and evil that's out there? God, why? What he's essentially saying is, why did this have to happen in my generation? Why couldn't somebody else have had this? Why couldn't I have just had good days? You ever feel that? Ever look around at your culture and your world and think, I'm sad to bring up kids in this world? Some of you have had that experience. I'm sad to bring up grandkids in this world, the state of things, how it's gotten. This is what Habakkuk is saying. It is difficult for me to be part of this culture right now in its history. God, why? There's a, a moment in the Lord of the Rings, which I quote now and again. <laughs> uh, so I love it. And, and, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, Frodo and Gandalf and all those people, you know. And if you know anything about his history, he actually fought. He was a soldier in World War I. Um, and so he knows something about destruction and difficulty. And so he gives this line to Frodo. He says, Frodo says in the book, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf said, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Some good wisdom there. So when Habakkuk goes to describe to God, again, he's yelling at God here. How long, God? Why haven't you moved yet, God? Why haven't you fixed this yet, God? When he goes to describe what it is that he's seen in this corrupt generation, the first word he uses is violence. 
violence. Violence and strife. And, and I don't know exactly what he means by that violence. That could be family violence. That could be violence against the poor. That could be, you can't even go out on the streets at night. It's so dangerous kind of violence. And then he says strife and contention, which might not seem like that big of a thing, but think about it for just a minute. Strife and contention are everywhere. Wait, what do you mean? You mean people are fighting so much, they're so polarized in their opinions, they can't even have conversations anymore? Is that what you mean? Because this doesn't sound familiar at all. And everybody's so against each other's throats, they don't even feel like a unified people anymore. And it starts to spill over into actual violence because they've been hating each other's guts for so long. Yeah, that doesn't sound familiar at all. Strife and contention. And then he says the law, the Torah is paralyzed. So he's not just talking about the law of the land and the judicial system, although that is part of it. But the Torah was God's revealed will about how to live, the Bible. And he's saying it's paralyzed. What poetic language. He's saying it's there. The Bible's there. You can open it up and look at it, but it's got no power. It's there, but it's got no power. It's like a dead body. You can see the body, but the body's not doing anything. It's paralyzed because nobody does it. Nobody trusts it. Nobody uses God's word as a moral compass anymore. We've all got our own moral compass. Again, does this sound familiar at all? And as soon as we've all got our own moral compass, what starts to happen? We do our own thing. And especially our leaders, all of a sudden you've got judges and you've got governors and you've got kings who do exactly what they want because power corrupts. Power corrupts. And if there's no moral compass to guide you back to God, power corrupts absolutely. So we got stories about King Ahab, who was in the, the uh, uh, northern kingdom, actually. King ah Ahab, at one point, he saw somebody's vineyard. This guy named Naboth had a vineyard. And he just decided as king, I've got the army and Naboth doesn't. So I'm going to go take the vineyard. And he just does. Because power corrupts. So he's had it with this culture. Even the prophets, by the way. There's a, there's a reference in there not here in Habakkuk, but in other places where it discusses the prophets of God and the fact that some prophets, you could, you could buy them off. That's how corrupt everything had gotten. Can you imagine that? You could go to a, a professional prophet and you could say, I'm going to give you this much money and I want you to give me a good prophecy about my life. Even though my life is in shatters over here, I want you to tell me how great God is going to make everything turn out. And in some cases, those prophecies were made public as a boost to my reputation. They bought off God's leaders. That's how bad things were getting. So Habakkuk has had it with his culture and he wants God to come and do something. He wants God to come and do something, but don't miss this part. What does he want God to come and do? Okay, God, I'd like you to maybe off this one king and give us a better king. Or maybe let's start a 24 seven prayer room and let's get some nationwide revival going. Like he's got some things in mind, but this is not what God is going to give him. God's going to give him some bad news. Verse five, God's answer. Look among the nations, Habakkuk, and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. This is like saying, is it too good to be true? No, actually, in this case, it's too bad to be true, what God's about to do. For behold, I am raising up the Babylonians, some of your versions say Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings that are not their own. It's too bad to be true. God's bringing a foreign nation against Israel and he's gonna judge Israel, Judah in this case. God says, I'm not gonna do revival this time, Habakkuk. He says, there's so much violence and Judah wants violence. I'm going to bring violence against them as their consequence. It's brutal news. Could you imagine being discouraged about the spiritual darkness that you see in our own country and asking God to bring revival here? And he says, instead of revival, I'm going to bring the Russians to invade. And that's crazy thought. But there are times that God says, the answer this time is judgment. And that's just true. 
Habakkuk says, no, that's not what I wanted. God continues talking, verse 9. They all come for violence. He's describing the Babylonians. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. At rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. For they pile up earth and take it. And then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men who, whose own might is their God. So, so God says, listen, they are guilty. Uh, see, you got to see that at the end. God's got no illusions about the fact that the Babylonians are pretty bad people themselves. So Judah has become evil, and God's going to bring another evil nation to bring judgment against them. And God's got no illusion. He says, I know they're guilty. I know he's like, they even worship their own army and their own strength as a God. Like they respect their own strength more than they respect the God of heaven. And that's who I'm bringing. Now, if that's not messing with your idea of God right now, it should be. Because it almost feels like he's using someone evil to accomplish his good purpose. And yes, he will. And we're going to dive into that philosophical quandary more next week. We're really going to go into it because chapter two is all about it. Because Habakkuk does not like that, by the way. But I'm just going to tell you really, really quick in case you're not here next week. God will sometimes use evil nations and evil people to accomplish his purposes. But it does not mean that he endorses them. And we're responsible to understand the difference. Okay. So Habakkuk's going to pray again. Again, it's a back and forth between him and God. Verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. He means the Babylonians there. You ordained them as a judgment. And you, O Rock, have established them for a reproof. He's, he's kind of accepting reality of what God has told him is going to happen. And Habakkuk has got a whole lot more to say in this particular prayer, in this speech. But I'm going to hit pause right there for the rest of the message. We're going to look at the rest of his speech next week. But I want to pause right here. Because what he does here, I think is so important, we need to talk about it. This, this is a moment of a man of God receiving the worst news possible. Have you ever received bad news before? And when we receive bad news and we go through a difficult time, we have to know how to respond with God. And he shows us this in his prayer life, his response. And I think it's so instructive for us. I just think we need to stop and take a quick look at it. It's one of the reasons I wanted to do this book in the first place, to be, to be real with you. I have just felt for several weeks now that God has been directing our minds over and over again toward prayer. Have you noticed that? Like we, we talked even back at Mother's Day about how you need to give just even a bit of space as a parent to prayer and listening to God and letting God minister to you. And then we did the parable that talked about the persistent widow, right? And the mega jerk judge. And the fact that she prayed and then she prayed again and then she prayed again and then she prayed again. We got to pray and never give up, Jesus said. And then last week we talked about holy ground moments where sometimes you go and you just, you decide to shut out the world and listen to God and God will speak. And so here's Habakkuk and he's showing us how to pray again. I think it's massive for us. So let me break, break down this verse for you one phrase at a time because the elements of it are essential for us. So the very first phrase, are you not from everlasting, he says to God. One Hebrew scholar says he is insulting God with that phrase. He is saying, I thought you were eternal, Lord. Why are you going to do this? I thought you were eternal. Oh, Lord, my God, my holy one. Oh, Lord, my God. Lord there, if, if you look in your, I, I didn't do it up there on the screen, but if you look in your, your scripture, it's L-O-R-D, all caps. You know what that is? That's your translators taking the, 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 the ancient, the holy name of God, Yahweh, and translating it into something English that you can say. Yahweh. That's the holy name of God. It's the Hebrew name of God. It's the personal name of God. He says, oh Lord, my God, and that my there is absolutely essential. Because that's covenant language. When you say my, that means you're in covenant with somebody. And that might sound like fancy talk, but let's just talk about my wife for a second, Linda. She is my Linda. It would be inappropriate for you to call her your Linda. 
She is not your Linda. She is my Linda. Because we are in covenant together, yes? So we, you don't use those words unless covenant relationship is behind it. He says, oh Lord, my God, my Holy One. So he first starts by insulting God, said, I thought you were eternal. But my Lord, my Holy One, do you see him shifting around through the emotions? Is he's connecting to God on a personal level. He says, we're talking about really big things with nations overtaking nations. But what about just you and me? See, this is how he handles bad news. He says, we shall not die. Massive. We shall not die. Do you hear the faith in what he's saying? Oh, Lord, my God. <sighs> yeah, maybe you're going to bring Babylon. Maybe it's going to be bad. Maybe we're going to lose, but we will not be ultimately destroyed. Like if there's going to be battles, will people die? Of course people will die. Of course, this is going to be a bad, bad judgment from God. But we will not ultimately be destroyed. Some of you guys know the just wonderful passage in Isaiah. It says, you might go through the water, but you're not going to be drowned. You might go through the fire, but you will not be ultimately be destroyed by the fire. There's this concept in God's word where he says, hey, listen, part of what was purchased for you on the cross was eternity with Jesus in heaven. So no matter what happens to you in this life, ultimately you have life. Ultimately, you will be healed. Ultimately, I've got you. And, and you see that faith come through with Habakkuk. Before I lose my mind entirely, we shall not die. He's got to remind himself. And he says it to God. I love that. This is, this is a model prayer from Habakkuk that, that I believe follows this formula, if we could turn this into math. The Habakkuk prayer, and some of you like math, right? So the Habakkuk prayer, it's honesty and it's faith. That's what he's doing. Is he's, got, he's gotten bad news. He's in a terrible moment with God and he brings honesty and then he brings faith to the equation. Total honesty. How long, O oh Lord, will you ignore me? How long, O oh Lord, will you refuse to answer me, refuse to deal with these problems? I thought you were eternal, God. He brings it, but he also brings the honesty, or he also brings the faith at the end, which is massive. Let's start with the honesty really quick. Religious people have a problem with honesty. If your faith is in a religious place, there is something where you see your relationship with God as temperamental. You have to be formal in your interactions with him. You have to get the words just right or he won't do the thing that you want him to do or he may be angry with you. And so you watch your P's and Q's with him, yes? You just do. And things are temperamental and things are formal and they're not relationship. If you're in a religious place with your prayer life with God, you are not going to a place of authentic relationship with him. I'm actually going to show you more prayers throughout the scripture where the different saints brought all their emotional reality to God. And when we don't do that, what we tend to do is we tend to stuff it. We tend to stuff our feelings. Okay. Okay. So there was a time, me and my dad, there was a camping trip. I was in my teens. And he did not take me on said camping trip. And I was mad. And I didn't understand. And he just did it. He didn't explain. And for 10 years, I stuffed it. I mean, like, dude, get over your camping trip for heaven's sake. I know. I'm not saying I was seeing him every single Christmas and going camping trip, you know, it wasn't like that, but it was there. Come on, you know what I'm saying. It was still there. And again, 10 years later, he and I are like standing next to, to his truck on the road, and we're talking about another camping trip that we we're about to take. And all of a sudden, it came up, and that old pain came up. And I took the moment. I was, I was in a more emotionally healthy place as a person at that time, and I brought the whole thing up to him. And he was able to explain what his mindset was and why. And he was still a blockhead. He shouldn't have done it. 
But at least he explained what was going through his mind and what he hadn't said then, and at least helped some. It helped me to process through with him and to get on better footing relationally with the guy. Why? Because I wasn't stuffing it anymore. I brought all that reality out into the light and we worked through it together. Again, it wasn't perfect, but some of you guys have got feelings with God and you're stuffing them. And when you stuff them, you're not working through anything with God. You're not, you're not allowing him to come and bring his answers and his perspective because you're just not saying it. And so it's a fake relationship. I know that's harsh to say, but you're not going where you want to go. It stays in this place of religion. Reli religious people can't do the honesty, but also secular folks can't do the faith part. And the faith part is also super necessary. Why? Because if you just go and you just unpack your dark feelings to God all the time, what you will do is stir your doubt in an unending way and you will enter despair and darkness. And none of us appreciate that in our relationships either right? Like when Linda comes to me and says, Josh, you really blew it here. You know what I want her to say at the end, but I know that's not your heart. And I know that that's not what you always do. That's what I want. Come on, somebody. Yes. Like you can tell me the truth, but I want you to believe in me. Or cause that just, and I love what Habakkuk does. He says, God, I thought you were eternal. And I'm really mad about this but I know we will not die. I know you've got us one way or another. I know you've got us. And he brings that faith to the Lord. And I love that. Let me give you five sample prayers and then we'll be done. These are prayers from other people in your Bible because I want you to know just how consistent this is through your Bible that people pray this way. The very first one is Abraham in Genesis 18. And here's how I summarize it. God, it feels like you're doing the wrong thing. You ever, ever felt like that? Ever feel like culture makes more sense to me than you do, God? The values in the society around me make more sense than what I'm reading in my Bible over here? God, I don't know how to reconcile all this. God, you're not making sense. We felt that before. Abraham comes in Genesis chapter 18 and says, should not the judge of all the earth do right? It's a massive moment in the Old Testament. Some of you guys have studied this before. Sodom and Gomorrah is about to be destroyed by God. Abraham's got Lot, his nephew, and their whole family is there. Abraham's standing before God, and he's negotiating with him in prayer. And he's saying, surely you would not destroy the city if my family is still in it who loves you. And then he throws out that line, should not the judge of all the earth do right? I mean, if God was ever going to smite anybody dead, he should have smote him right there. Did I get the grammar right? Smote. I don't know if that's right. Smitten, maybe. No. <laughs> Can't be. <laughs> smoted. He should have been smoted. Um, how brazen. Should not the Lord of all the earth do right? Can't I expect you to do the right thing, God? Abraham said that. We've got to pray honest prayers to God. As I go through the, the rest of these four, this could be good theory for you, could be theology, could be philosophy for you. Here's how it becomes really practical and helpful for you before you leave this morning. If you listen to the rest of these prayers and, and think to yourself for a second, God, what's the biggest crisis I'm going through right now? What's the thing that I'm stuffing with you right now? And I'm having a hard time talking to Almighty God about this. I've just not shared it yet. I've not dealt with it yet. This is the big item going on in my life and I'm not praying effectively through it because one of these is your prayer. Next, God, I feel like you hurt me. This is Job. Job 13, 15, he says, though you slay me, God, I will hope in you, yet I will argue my ways to your face, he says. I love that. He says, I, I've got a perspective here and I'm going to argue. He's like, but my hope is in you at the same time. Honesty and hope. I love that Job does that. The next one is, God, you're downright confusing. This is Jeremiah. 
Look what he says, Jeremiah 15, 18. He says, why is my pain unending and my wound is grievous and incurable? You are to me like a a deceptive brook, God, like a spring that fails. So Jeremiah uses his poetic language against God in this verse. He's like, you're like a spring that fails, God. He's like, God, it's like I go to a spring out in the woods where I depend to get water from it, fresh water all the time. It's so consistent because it's a fresh spring. And I came to it suddenly one day and it's empty and there's nothing there. That's how my prayer life feels like with you, God, right now. Wow, should have been smoted for that, Jeremiah. Next one's David. God, I've prayed so long and you don't seem to care. Psalm 13, David says, God, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And then you get to the end of that Psalm. C.H. Spurgeon called this the how long Psalm. You get to the very end of the Psalm and David says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I'm really mad, but I do trust you. (laughs) Very last one. God, it feels like you've abandoned me. And this one's Jesus himself. God, it feels like you've abandoned me. Do you remember when Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we've read that so much and we've maybe studied it so much and it's so part of Easter and all that kind of stuff. We forget Jesus is being emotional on the cross. He's calling out to his father and this distance that we've got right now does not feel good. It's essentially what he said, why? He uses the words, why? You're like, Jesus, you're the son of God. You know all the prophecies. You know this had to happen like this. But he's still screaming out, why? He's being honest. And then moments later, he says, into your hands, I commit my spirit, which is faith. Because as confused as I am, and as much as I'm struggling, I am moments from crossing the threshold of death And when I cross that threshold, I need to know, Father, that you've got me on the other side. Some of you are facing down a cancer diagnosis today. And you're like, will he catch me on the other side? Come on, somebody. Some of you, it's a family, it's it's a loved one. And you're afraid of losing them. Will the Father in heaven catch them on the other side? Some of you lost somebody already. And Father, do you have them? And Jesus says, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's there's no deeper trust than that. No deeper faith. There's times I've gone and done graveside service with a family who's lost someone that that they love. And we sit there surrounded by death and surrounded by tombstones. And we pray the prayer together. God, into your hands, we commit their spirit. We're gonna trust that you've caught them on the other side. Amen? Amen. Because he's earned that trust from us. Let's pray. Jesus, I know there's movement in the room. But Lord, just just now, before we, we shift this moment, God, I pray that you would come for those who have got their crisis and they've been stuffing their feelings, God, and they've not learned this Habakkuk prayer quite yet, give them this spirit of honesty with you. Help them to go there. Whether they're praying in the car or they're in the mountains or wherever they are, God, I pray that they would have their moment with you, God, that they they would get that stuff out. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet them. And I pray that you would give them faith. In Christ's name, amen.